Hast du angefangen? Okay. All right. What are the take home messages of our section one on uh, interesting examples on multi loop calculations and uh, associated renormalization? We saw in our examples that if we do a one loop calculation, we encounter one over epsilon divergency, so single poles in d minus four or d minus six, and the coefficients were polynomials in the masses and momenta of the Feynman graphs. If we go to the two loop level, we encounter one over epsilon square and one over epsilon poles, but the coefficients are not always polynomials. They can be non-polynomial and in position space, that means non-local terms which cannot be written down in a Lagrangian. If we uh, look at uh, subtlety, namely uh, graphs where we have actually a two-loop graph, but we uh, have here such a finite blob because we made one subdiagram finite by adding the associated counterterm Feynman diagram, then this is something that one could think has good properties, but it doesn't always. It can still have one over epsilon square and one over epsilon poles, and it can still have non-polynomial coefficients. What is the right structure to do renormalization is to do a two-loop calculation plus a complete sub-renormalization, which means we have to add all one-loop counterterm Feynman diagrams with previously determined one-loop counterterm insertions. For example, this two-loop graph plus these two counterterm graphs where these counterterms have been determined at the one-loop level. If we do that, then we obtain one over epsilon square and one over epsilon poles, but the coefficients are polynomial again in the uh, momentum or also in the masses. Then we have looked at a criterion, namely the superficial degree of divergence, which is very simply obtained by looking at the overall power counting of the loop integral. And then in our phi cube theory in six dimensions, which are our um, typical theory, uh, we only have three types of graphs which have superficial divergence, uh, zero or bigger, namely the tadpole, the two-point function, and the three-point function. And all other types of graphs in that theory have superficial degree of divergence less than zero, which helps us in organizing the renormalization. I didn't write it on the blackboard, but we also did uh, last time an example using Schwinger parameters, which is uh, kind of orthogonal to this discussion, more a technical development, but we saw that in Schwinger parameters we get a replacement uh, instead of doing loop integrations over momenta, we have integrations over alpha parameters and the ultraviolet divergences manifest themselves in uh, the alpha integration at small alpha, where we have an integrand, which is a determinant of a certain matrix uh, in a quadratic form of the loop momenta. And so this uh, will help us mathematically to understand better uh, the divergence structure at higher orders. Now, let us go to the second chapter of the lecture, which is on the forest formula and further Feynman graph relations. So this is a serious section. Now we will develop a lot of important um, information on Feynman diagrams, but this section is basically graphical only. So our proofs and our discussions will be on the level of graphs. Therefore, there are no integrals in this section, no convergence discussions and so on. Uh, there are only graph theoretical relationships and in that way we will do most proofs actually on a graph by graph basis and maybe we will do some proofs by uh, looking at examples rather than uh, developing a formal graph theory which one could also do. And uh, just since I mentioned this, uh, there is one reference where you can find a lot of uh, explicit proofs with mathematical formalism in graph theory language. This is a book by Nakanishi, which is actually really well readable uh, from 1970 on uh, Feynman graphs. it contains uh, the associated Feynman graph proofs. But uh, as you will see, I think it is really sufficient 
to prove them by uh, looking at typical examples. So let me go through some definitions uh, associated with Feynman graphs. First of all, there are so-called connected graphs. And what this is is obvious. Let me just draw an example here. Let's say this is a connected graph. And uh, so it could look like this. Very complicated graphs are possible. So these are connected graphs. And now a uh, more interesting and important definition are one particle irreducible graphs. These are Feynman graphs which are connected and stay connected if we cut any internal line. So this is not one particle irreducible because if we cut this line, it does not stay connected. Or if we cut that line or that. So this is a, a graph which is reducible. And the irreducible parts of it are, for example, this loop here or that loop over there. And so a typical one particle irreducible diagram would be something like this, or at the two loop level, something like that, and so on. And in our definition of one particle irreducible, the external lines do not belong to the one particle irreducible graph. So if you would write down the mathematical formula, it would be the product of the vertices and the internal propagators and the loop momentum integration. Then there are uh, so-called spanning trees in Feynman graphs. These are defined as maximal subgraphs, which are tree-level graphs. This is not unique. So let us go through some examples. So let's say, what are the spanning trees of uh, this graph, so one spanning tree is a maximal, so maximal means you cannot add any additional line uh, um, unless it becomes a loop graph. So a maximal spanning tree here would be this, for example. It's just the upper half of the diagram. This is a spanning tree. Or alternatively, the lower line, but not both, because uh, then we have a loop graph. Okay, so this graph has exactly two spanning trees. What is an example spanning tree for the right graph here? One spanning tree would be this one here. So let's maybe draw it directly in the diagram. So let's say this line here, this line here, and uh, that line. This gives us one spanning tree for this graph, because if we add the line here at the bottom, we have a loop. If we add this line here at the bottom, we also have a loop. That means these three lines form one spanning tree of the upper graph. But as I said, this is not unique. There are more spanning trees. For example, you could choose this one okay, and leave out this line and that line. And if you add back any of this or that line, you have a loop graph again. How many spanning trees does this graph have overall? Or in other words, which lines can you leave out? So let's draw some more examples. So you can for sure have this, which is basically reflected. You can also have that. Can you have anything else as a spanning tree? So here you leave out these two lines, then you leave out these two lines, you leave out these two lines, you leave out these two lines. Can you have a spanning tree where you leave out the middle line? For example, this. So we have left out this line and that line. That is also possible. It is a spanning tree because if we add back this line, we have a loop. If we add back that line, we also have a loop. Okay. So uh, actually, this is not a complete list. So this graph already has many spanning trees. But you see, each spanning tree has exactly three lines. And two lines are left out. Namely, you have to leave out two lines which would uh, give one of the two loops in the two-loop diagram. Uh, 
All right. Then there is a subgraph. What is a subgraph is obvious. I don't need to define it. But if we say, don't say anything else, a subgraph may be the full graph as well. It may be a zero, it may be the empty set, or it may be the full graph or anything in between. And if you uh, define a graph by vertices and lines, then the subgraph will always contain lines and all the attached vertices at the lines that the subgraph contains by definition. Then there is something called reduced graph, which we write as a big graph G divided by a subgraph gamma. And the definition is the graph G, which is obtained by contracting the subgraph gamma to a point. So this is a new graph. So let's do some examples. For example, let's take again uh, the two-loop graph here. And uh, define a subgraph. And then contract the subgraph to a point. So for example, let us uh, do the most obvious example. So here the left half of the diagram now defines a subgraph. So the red graph is our subgraph gamma. Then what is G divided by this subgraph gamma? It is the graph where this red triangle is contracted to a point. So these three lines don't exist anymore. They are now all connected in, let's call it a red dot. And then what remains are, uh, is the rest of the diagram. So here the external line, then this line, let's say line four and line five. Line four connects to this blob and to the right external vertex. And line five also connects to this dot and to the external vertex. And these three lines are all now inside the blob. This is now one vertex of the reduced graph. So you can do, for each subgraph, you can do this. Let's do it for a second example. Any suggestions for another subgraph that we can take? Let's take a one loop subgraph to make it nicer. The right one, but this would look essentially the same. Is there something else you can do? So the outer loop, let's do this uh, just to uh, inspire our uh, imagination. So this is also a subgraph. It doesn't look like a subgraph maybe, but it is a subgraph of course. So this outer loop, what happens if we contract? So this outer loop is now our subgraph gamma. So it contains these four lines, but it doesn't contain the middle line. So let's call the middle line, line number three. What is then our G divided by gamma? So we have one blob, and the blob contains now all these four outer lines. We have an external vertex. The external vertex left connects to the blob, of course. The right external vertex also connects to the blob. Therefore, the two outer lines are now both attached to the same red blob vertex. Now what happens to the line number three? The line three starts at the blob and it ends at the blob. So the graph looks like this. This is now our line three connected to the blob. And all the rest of the lines are all summarized here. So this is how such a um, reduced graph can look like. And clearly, if you start with a two-loop graph and uh, you uh, define a one-loop graph, gamma, then the reduced graph will be the remaining one-loop graph as well. Okay, so these are some definitions of graphs that we will need. And now let us do our first derivation. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, genau. Uh, in the top. <laughs> 
counter term Lagrangian and the R operation recursion formula. This is one of the central formulas of renormalization theory, and we will derive here its connection to a counter term structure. So our question is, what is actually the structure of counter terms from having a counter term Lagrangian at the one loop, two loop, three loop level, and so on. Let us go through some examples and see what happens. We start iteratively at the one loop level, then we will go to the two loop and then to the three loop level, and then we can read off the general result. At the one loop level, let us start with any one particle irreducible graph. G. Then, as we will have seen from our explicit calculations, uh, this graph can have a 1 over epsilon divergence, and the divergent part is a polynomial in the momenta in particular. Let us define this as T uh, circle gamma uh, G. So this is a circle operation, and this T, uh, T stands for Taylor operator, but uh, it's, it's actually not a Taylor expansion. In dimensional regularization, you might think of a Laurent expansion in 1 over epsilon, and this operation would extract the 1 over epsilon poles. Or if you think in terms of a Taylor expansion in the momenta, then this Taylor operation would extract the polynomial of uh, the necessary degree in the momenta which corresponds to the divergence. Anyway, let us denote the divergent part of this graph by T circle G. Then, since it is a polynomial, it can be represented by a counterterm Feynman rule, so it defines a counterterm Feynman rule. Let's call this C of G. This is the counterterm Feynman rule associated with uh, the graph, and this must be defined, of course, as minus the divergent part of the graph, minus T circle G. Since it is local, it can be represented by a counterterm Feynman rule uh, from stemming from a Lagrangian, so it defines a contribution to a counterterm Lagrangian which we can write as the contribution from this particular graph as L counterterm with an index G, specific for this graph. And if we then look at all graphs of the theory at the one loop level, then we get a full one loop counterterm Lagrangian, which is the sum of all one particle irreducible one loop graphs G. And for each of these one loop graphs, we add up the necessary counter term Lagrangian. And then we have found our full counter term Lagrangian. If we use this to generate the counter term Feynman rules and add the Feynman rules from here to the original Feynman rules, then our theory is finite at the one loop level. This is a clear structure, and we have seen it working in examples. And, um, and this is, I would say, obvious. Okay, so at the one loop level, uh, there is an algorithm which defines from each Feynman graph eventually a full one loop counter term Lagrangian. So now what happens at the two loop level? At the two loop level, we have now already determined our one loop counter term Lagrangian, so we compute green functions and Feynman diagrams using already the sum of our classical Lagrangian plus the previously determined one loop counter term Lagrangian. If we do that, then we obtain uh, the actual two loop graphs plus their corresponding sub loop renormalization. Let us go through some examples. 
One example I want to consider is this Feynman diagram, our famous beloved uh, one particle irreducible two loop self energy. So let's call this our first graph GA. Now, this would be the graph that you obtain using the classical Lagrangian at the two loop level. Now, the subloop renormalization of this graph is obtained if you add all the corresponding counterterm graphs stemming from counterterm Feynman rules. So here, as we have seen in our example, we have this one loop counterterm insertion inserted into this one loop diagram, plus the same on the right here, a one loop counterterm diagram with a one loop counterterm insertion, where these counterterms have been previously determined from the divergence of this three point function at the one loop level. So by definition, this counterterm is minus the divergent part of this. Okay, so this is one example which happens then at the two loop level. Another example that can happen at the two loop level is the following. So if we have a one particle reducible graph, for example, something simple like this, Okay, so this is one particle reducible, so it contains some three level parts, and here two individual one loop diagrams. This is of course also something that happens. And here as well you could add a lot of three level stuff at the end and so on, but uh, this does not change the structure of renormalization, so let's uh, in the first line only look at something one particle irreducible, but here let's look at something one particle reducible and what happens if you do the subloop renormalization, in other words, if you add all corresponding graphs which have one loop counterterm insert, then you get this plus this namely you replace the first loop by a counterterm or the second loop by a counterterm or you replace both loops by a one loop counterterm all of this is what you automatically obtain if you take seriously the Feynman rules uh, from the classical Lagrangian and the one loop counterterm Lagrangian and each of those counterterms here is determined to be minus the divergent part of that Now we want to read off from this the general structure and uh, let me just make some space. So overall we can in each case say the following. The subloop renormalized version of the two loop graph is obtained as follows. We first add up the actual two loop graph, then we have a sum over the following possibilities, namely we take all one loop, one particle irreducible subgraphs let's call it small gamma and for each of these one loop subgraphs we do the following we take each time the reduced graph g divided by gamma and replace the subgraph gamma by the corresponding counter term c of gamma this structure is exactly what has happened here in the top line Namely, the first diagram corresponds to the left triangle contracted to a point, as we discussed before, and uh, the point is then replaced by the one loop counter term. And uh, the second is obtained by replacing the right triangle by the corresponding counter term. However, there is no term corresponding to our uh, subgraph where we had the outer loop contracted to a point. And that is simply because uh, that associated counter term would be finite. 
because that would correspond to a finite one loop term. So this is zero for finite one loop graphs. such as this one loop graph. So the one loop graph that we had here, let me draw it in the same way as we did. So the inner line, line number three, did not belong to the subgraph. So the graph is actually a one loop graph with four external lines. It's a one loop four point function and that is finite and therefore this does not contribute. So only the two triangle subgraphs contribute. And in the lower line, this formula uh, explains this diagram here. We take the left one loop sub diagram and replace it by the counter term. Here we replace the right sub diagram by a counter term. But this formula does not cover this diagram here. So uh, this is not yet complete. Okay, let's do it here. So we also have to add over the following, namely uh, over all combinations of two disjoint one loop, one particle irreducible sub diagrams. So two disjoint one particle irreducible one loop uh, subgraphs, gamma one and gamma two. And then here we have exactly two such disjoint one loop subgraphs and then each of them can be replaced by a counter term. So this would be this, we divide G, divide by gamma one uh, combined with gamma two times the counter term for gamma one times the counter term for gamma two. And something like this does not happen in the top line because there are no two disjoint one loop sub diagrams and therefore there is no way that you can have a corresponding uh, diagram with two such one loop counter term insertions. But this is the complete formula which uh, is true for all two loop diagrams. I wanted to mention a subtlety. If I say disjoint here, then um, disjoint subgraphs mean that they do not share a line and they do not share a vertex. So here it doesn't happen, but I mean in a phi to the fourth here you could have something that looks like this. Where four lines meet at a vertex and then you might wonder if I split it into two and then this subgraph or that subgraph, are they disjoint or not? They are not disjoint because they share one vertex. Okay, so just to make that clear. Another subtlety I wanted to mention. So here in this product uh, of two counter terms, in dimensional regularization we might uh, know that this is one over epsilon uh, and possibly plus a constant and so on, um, depending on our renormalization conditions, plus some constant. And uh, uh, each of these factors is really defined just by making finite one corresponding one loop diagram. So this is not meant to make finite uh, possibly the product of the two uh, one loop diagrams. So, uh, um, okay, how should I say it? I think it's um, probably more important at a two loop or three loop or four loop level. Um, here, what I have in mind cannot really happen, but what I want to say is, okay, let's let's do it, let's say a four, at the four loop level, you have two, two loop graphs. Each of them contains one over epsilon square, so the full divergence goes up to one over epsilon to the fourth. But uh, if you imagine the product at the one over epsilon level, 
And this could get contributions from 1 over epsilon square from the left diagram times order epsilon from the right diagram. So there is a divergent part in the product which uh, is depending on the finite, actually on the order epsilon part of one of the two. So now you might say, should the product of the counter terms make finite the product of the two two-loop diagrams or should each factor make finite just one single factor here? And the answer is the second. Each counter term is responsible only for the corresponding two-loop diagram. So therefore, this counter term does, is not supposed uh, to contain anything related to an order epsilon part of the diagram. Therefore, you might leave out the one over epsilon part here from the renormalization constant and then this product here will not contain the same terms of the order one over epsilon square times epsilon. And therefore, the product of the two counter terms might not make finite the product of the two two-loop graphs. And that is okay by definition. So just to make that clear. But actually, this entire structure, this makes finite the product of the two two-loop graphs also at higher orders. So this is just a subtlety to uh, make clear that such terms uh, are not supposed to come from these products of counter terms. Good. Now we have uh, written down the general two-loop formula for a sub-renormalized graphs and uh, let's look at the result. If we look at case B, which was one particle reducible, then uh, adding the subgraphs and the, uh, adding the counter terms makes the whole thing completely finite, manifestly, because for each of these factors here, we have basically the combination loop plus counter term times loop plus counter term, and loop plus counter term is always finite. Therefore, the sum of these two Feynman graphs is, of course, finite. So in case B and in all reducible graphs like this, uh, we have immediately a finite result. But in case A, uh, as we know from our explicit examples, the result of this sum here is not finite, but we can assume that the divergence is a polynomial in the momentum. So then we are at the same situation as at one loop, we have a two-loop divergence. Let's define the two-loop divergence as T circle R bar of GA. So this is the remaining two-loop divergence of the sub-renormalized graph. And we know from experience this is 1 over epsilon square and 1 over epsilon times a polynomial. Then we go on like at one loop. We can define a counterterm Feynman rule. Which we can call C of the two loop graph GA. This uh, should correspond to a local interaction in a Lagrangian. So we can write this as a contribution to a two loop counterterm Lagrangian specific for this. Uh, particular two-loop graph GA. And if we go through the same sequence of steps for all one particle irreducible two-loop graphs, then we obtain a full two-loop counterterm Lagrangian as the sum of all two-loop one particle irreducible graphs G. And for each of them, we sum up the corresponding counterterm Lagrangian obtained in this sequence of steps. All right, then let's go to the three loop level. At the three loop level, we compute using the classical Lagrangian plus 
the one loop counter term Lagrangian plus the two loop counter term Lagrangian. Then we obtain three loop uh, contributions which are fully sub renormalized. What is the structure? Let's look at one example, R bar of G, where we take the following three loop example. So we have here this self energy diagram with three loops, two triangles at the right and left, and a square in the middle. So, what is the sub renormalized version of this graph? Which counter term graphs can we add uh, associated with this uh, three loop self energy? So if you just take all the counter terms which exist at the one loop level and at the two loop level, then we can simply write down all the corresponding graphs which we obtain. So at the one loop level, we have counter terms for vertices and self energies. And at the two loop level, we again have counter terms for vertices and self energy. So one contribution that we get from a one loop counter term is for example this one, so where this triangle is replaced by a counter term, then the graph would look like this. So we have shrunk the triangle to a point, replaced it by the corresponding one loop counter term. Then we can also uh, have counter terms from the two loop counter term Lagrangian. The two loop counter term Lagrangian gives us two loop counter terms corresponding to a three point function. So for example, we can, um, actually maybe it's better in this case again to draw it like this. Let's go on here. We can have a two loop vertex correction counter term. And then we have simply a remaining one loop diagram. And then this is a three loop contribution which sub renormalizes that graph. And this counter term corresponds to the following. It corresponds to shrinking this sub diagram here to a point. Okay? So this is now a sub diagram, which is overall a three point function with two loops. And if we shrink that to a point, it directly corresponds to this counter term diagram. Then of course we have the same thing mirrored, let's say, where the counter terms are on the right. These are distinct diagrams which one has to add. But then there is more. Now we can have, uh, for example, two insertions of one loop counter terms. How can we have two insertions of one loop counter terms? For example, we can have this. Here a one loop counter term insertion and here another one loop counter term insertion. That means we have shrunk both triangles to a point. Let me denote the sub diagrams with uh, some uh, names. So the red triangle sub diagram with two loops, let's call it gamma three. Then the single triangle on the left, let's call it gamma one and the right triangle, let's call it gamma two. Then gamma three is a superset of gamma one, contains gamma one, but gamma three and gamma two, they are overlapping. And that's all. If you go through all the counter term Lagrangians and counter term Feynman rules, then these are the complete set of counter term Feynman diagrams which are associated with this uh, three loop Feynman diagram. So we can shrink one loop diagrams to a point, we can shrink two one loop diagrams to a point, or we can shrink two loop diagrams to a point. These are the possibilities. And now all that remains to do is to write this in a mathematical way like we did on the upper blackboard for the two loop case. Let's just for each graph uh, write it in that notation of reduced graphs and just literally copy what we have here. 
So we start with the overall graph. Then this here means we take the graph and uh, shrink gamma 1 to a point and replace gamma 1 by its counter term C gamma 1, which is of course determined such that it makes this triangle finite. Then here we have G and we shrink the subdiagram gamma 3 to a point, the red box is now a point, and we multiply it with the counter term associated to this full gamma 3 plus mirrored, so let's say G gamma 2 times C gamma 2 plus uh, G over gamma 4. Gamma 4 is the obvious uh, mirror of gamma 3 times the counter term for gamma 4. And how can we write this object here? We can write it as G divided by gamma 1 union with gamma 2, the two triangles. Both are shrunk to a point times C counter term for gamma 1 times counter term for gamma 2. Now all of this is fairly obvious, but maybe let me point out one subtlety. Um, so here I stressed in this graph, the counter term is just there to make this triangle finite. This is how it was defined. Here, this counter term here arises in the formula by replacing this two loop graph gamma three uh, by a counter term. Okay, so gamma 3 is this graph. And uh, however, the counter term does not make this finite because uh, this has a non-polynomial divergence. Instead, this counter term makes finite the sub-renormalized version of that by definition from before. So there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between this counter term and that sub-diagram but instead between this counter term and the sub-renormalized version of it. Nevertheless, this is what we obtain by applying uh, counter term Feynman rules. And now we simply have to write it as a unified formula, just like we did over there. So this can be written as our graph G. Can we write it in a similar way like we did over there? So we can write it as a sum. What is the sum we actually take? We sum over all subdiagrams. We have one loop subdiagrams and we also allow two loop subdiagrams. All subdiagrams that we have here are one particle irreducible. And we can have either single one particle irreducible subdiagrams or we can have unions of disjoint one particle irreducible subdiagrams. So the general formula is we have here gamma 1, gamma 2, and uh, maybe and so on, which are disjoint um, one particle irreducible subgraphs. They must be different from the original graph, so the full graph cannot be uh, uh, appearing here in the sum. And then for each of these uh, choices of sets of subgraphs, we do G divided by the union of all these disjoint subgraphs, let's say up to S. S is the number of subgraphs that we happen to take, times the product of all the individual counter terms for each of those 1PI subgraphs. That is the formula we have obtained here. This fits to that example. And now you can see from the structure how it arises that uh, it will come as no surprise that this is the general formula. We can uh, literally take it over and uh, the same structure will replicate itself also at higher orders. And so this is the recursion formula that I wanted to aim for. And so let's summarize it now. This is the result of this section. At even higher orders, nothing else can happen. 
And therefore, let us write down the main conclusion of this section. It is now clear from these examples that we have at all orders our sub-renormalized graph R bar of G can be written as the original graph plus this uh, sum over all sets of gamma 1 up to gamma s and these are disjoint one particle irreducible subgraphs different from the original graph and we sum over the same times the product of all the counter terms for each of these subgraphs. That is the structure of uh, subrenormalization which arises from adding counter terms. So then along with this, if we again assume that the divergence is a polynomial and it can be written as a counterterm Lagrangian, then we can define, let's say, a counterterm for the overall graph, which is minus the divergence of the sub-renormalized graph. And then we can define the full R of G without bar. This is the fully renormalized graph. And this is then what we obtain by taking the sub-renormalized graph plus the overall counter term for the graph. This overall counter term is then simply a new n-loop counter term Feynman rule, which removes the remaining polynomial divergence. And this then, of course, can be um, written as a um, Lagrangian. So all of this corresponds to computation using the classic Lagrangian plus the full counter term Lagrangian where the counter term Lagrangian is the sum of all one particle irreducible graphs G and for each graph at any loop order we have obtained in this way an associated overall counter term for the graph which can be written as a Lagrangian. This is the main statement of this section and let me just comment it Often in the literature, you find uh, that this um, recursion formula appears in the context of very complicated discussions. I hope that this discussion was not so complicated. The difference is that this formula can be used as a starting point to give a convergence proof for convergent integrals. But we have not done a convergence proof here. We have not discussed the integrals at all. What we have done is to figure out the equivalence of the structure of either adding counter terms in a Lagrangian or applying this recursion formula on the level of graphs. So this is equivalent. This is what we have now established. And so we can use either counter term structures or the recursion formula for graphs to uh, do the next step and maybe find a convergence proof for the actual integrals. So the convergence proof would then, of course, require a precise definition of this operation which extracts the divergence. We need to prove that this is always possible and uh, may be unique and has uh, properties which are compatible with local quantum field theory. And uh, after applying this, the integrals get finite. This we have not done, but we have established the equivalence of uh, renormalization on the level of counterterm Lagrangians and uh, applying uh, this graphical recursion formula on the level of graphs. Let me just give some references, more comments on this 
for example, on symmetry factors. So we have completely ignored all complications which arise from n factorials, symmetry factors, and so on. Though the actual counterterm Feynman rules give the same symmetry factors as you have from the original graphs and, and so on. This is discussed in uh, explicit in very great fantastic detail in Collins' book in section 5.7 and plus some examples in his uh, section 5.3. So I advise you to go to that book for those details on symmetry factors. But here is the same kind of proof. Then uh, another remark. In the literature, there exists the BPH theorem, Bogolyubov, Parasiuk, Hepp. Um, this theorem is then using exactly the recursion formula to prove, uh, combined, of course, with a precise definition of the T operation, to prove that the integrals become finite. And of course, R operation is basically the name for this operation which is described by the formula. Any questions? In the same spirit, let us now discuss the forest formula, which is also a famous formula uh, similar to this recursion formula. But the difference is that the forest formula doesn't involve recursion. But it's a direct, let's say, explicit formula. By the way, where is the recursion here? The recursion is, of course, in the definition of the counterterms, because the counterterms are defined by making finite some previously obtained R bar of something else. So we will now see it also how complicated the structure gets uh, if we look at the derivation of the forest formula. The forest formula has first been obtained by Zimmermann. And uh, maybe you have seen the acronym BPHZ. The Z stands for Zimmermann. And uh, so we will comment on that later. But let us derive the forest formula. So let us fix a graph G. Then uh, let me first give the definition of a forest um, U, which is associated with uh, the graph G. And the graph G, let it be one particle irreducible. A forest is a set of non-overlapping subdiagrams of the original um, graph. Non-overlapping one particle irreducible subdiagrams. Gamma, which are uh, subdiagrams of the graph G, and uh, equal to G is allowed. So mathematically, you can say this is the set of uh, gammas where if you take two of the gammas in the set, then either they are disjoint or one is part of the other. Gamma i is a subset of gamma j, so or, or gamma j is part of gamma i. So 
for each graph, there are many such forests. So each forest is a set. And uh, also the empty set is allowed. Then directly, let's say there is a full or normal forests. So I said the subgraphs may be the full graph, but that is kind of boring. So let's give that a special name. Uh, a full forest is a forest where the full graph is contained in it. Or a normal forest would be one which does not contain the full graph, which is maybe more interesting. So if you have any normal forest which does not contain the full graph, then you can always add the full graph and then, uh, yes, and then you get the full forest in this notation. So let us now, of course, do some examples. Let us again use our famous three loop diagram. and write down some forests. Each forest is a set, so we now need to write down a few different sets of subgraphs. So the first forest, let's call it U1, is the empty set. Just to make that clear, this is allowed. Second example. We take one, one particle irreducible subdiagram. For example, let's take the left triangle again, gamma one. Then one possible forest is simply the set containing gamma one. Let's write it graphically. So this is one very simple forest. What else is a forest? Let's say you have to take disjoint subgraphs or nested subgraphs, so, but no overlapping. So the, the term is either overlapping or disjoint or nested. Nested is allowed, uh, disjoint is allowed, but overlapping is not allowed. Okay? So here, two non-overlapping, in other words, disjoint subgraphs, gamma one, gamma two. So one forest that you are allowed to take is U3, is the set of these two subgraphs. Okay. This is a possible forest. What else is a forest? So for example, something with nesting. So let's remove the gamma two. Then something nested, so here. So gamma three contains gamma one. Uh, so there is a nesting between gamma one and gamma two, and then this would be also a forest. U4 contains gamma one and gamma three in nice uh, way of graphics. Gamma three looks just like this. So it's a two loop vertex correction, which contains gamma one. Could you also do this graph alone, so gamma three only, is this also a forest? Yes, this is also a forest. So any subset of a forest is still a forest. So do we have all qualitative choices? We have two disjoint graphs, we have nested graphs, we have single two loop graphs, single one loop graphs, empty set. And of course, you could add to any of the forests, you could add also the full diagram, then it still is a forest. Um, but these are normal forests, and let's not write the full forests because they are obvious. Okay, maybe here I have it. So let's just U6. Okay, let's uh, do it in this way, just to make use of that. We can also have the middle square this is also a subdiagram, so it has four external lines, and the full graph 
So this is now a full forest, which happens to contain also the square as an element. Sometimes one considers only forests which contain subdiagrams which are divergent. Then this would not be a forest because that diagram is finite. But for us now, we don't make this distinction or a criterion. We take all subgraphs. But of course, this will not contribute to renormalization since uh, because of its finiteness. Okay, but now we have understood what forests are. And of course, this is quite an abstract definition. It gives rise to a plethora of sets of graphs and so on. And we don't know yet what they are good for. But we will see that they offer a replacement for the recursion formula. And in order to see it, we just need to look at some examples. And I think um, probably I need to delete the upper blackboard here. So let's uh, keep in mind the recursion formula. And simply evaluate the recursion for exactly this three loop diagram. See what actually happens. Maybe I will just write here at the top of the page the recursion formula. So R bar of any graph is the graph plus the sum overall uh, possible subsets of one particle irreducible disjoint subdiagrams gamma 1 up to gamma s, then the reduced graph times the product of all the counter terms. This is the formula. So let us now evaluate this formula completely for this diagram. Actually, I think let's not evaluate it completely because what it gives, we have already done to some extent before. So we will get terms like G divided by the one loop subdiagram gamma one times the counter term for gamma one, which is G divided by gamma one times minus uh, the divergence of the one loop uh, subdiagram gamma one. So there is nothing else to evaluate here. But there are also terms like G divided by gamma three, a two loop subdiagram times the two loop counter term corresponding to gamma three. And this is now the thing we want to evaluate because here the recursion formula comes into play. So let us go through the steps. I already said uh, this counter term does not remove the divergence of the graph gamma three. Instead, it gives minus the divergence of the sub renormalized version of gamma three. And therefore, in order to, let's say, completely evaluate it, we have to plug in the definition of that. And what is this? So we get G divided by gamma three times minus the divergence of, um, so this is gamma three plus all the sub diagrams of gamma three times their corresponding counter terms. So we know uh, we have to sum over all disjoint subgraphs which are one particle irreducible and different from the original graph, but let's not write all of it. Let's just say gamma a part of gamma three and not equal to gamma three. And since gamma three is two loop, we cannot have two disjoint uh, graphs. It can only be one. 
one loop sub diagram and then we get uh, gamma three divided by gamma times the counter term corresponding to gamma. So this is the evaluation of this R bar of a two loop one particle irreducible graph gamma three. Gamma three was this two loop graph. So here we can now reduce ourselves to the one, uh, the divergent parts only. Then this two loop graph, which we called gamma three, contains precisely one single divergent one loop sub diagram. And this single divergent one loop sub diagram is the triangle here on the left, which we always called gamma one. So what we obtain here from the sum is g divided by gamma three times, um, the minus has gone lost, minus t, minus t applied to gamma three plus, the only term is uh, where the gamma here is gamma one, so we get gamma three divided by gamma one times minus the divergence of gamma one. So what arises here is a nesting. We have a nesting because we started out with a subgraph gamma three of the full graph, and then we have here another subgraph of gamma three itself. So we have a nesting gamma three is part of gamma, uh, gamma one is part of gamma three, and gamma three is part of G. And then we have here the divergence of gamma one, and then the divergence of the full thing. And here we also, by the way, could uh, make the remark that, uh, okay, maybe let us first introduce some notation which makes writing this easier because what you see here is you get a divergence um, or a reduced graph times the divergence of a subgraph. And a nicer notation for something like this would be T subscript gamma applied on the full graph. This is defined as exactly this, namely the reduced graph times uh, the divergence of the subgraph. So in words, it means replace the subgraph gamma by its divergent part. So this is a very natural operation. And this appears here, so using, using this new notation, the equation from before can be written like the following. So first we have here g over gamma three times minus t of gamma three. So this would be minus t subscript gamma three applied on the full graph. And then what do we have here? Here we have minus t applied on gamma one inserted into gamma three. So this is t subscript gamma one. So we replace gamma one inside the bigger graph by its divergence. And then we insert it back into gamma three, but then we also take the full graph and replace gamma three by its divergence. So this can be written as T subscript gamma three applied on T subscript gamma one applied on the full graph G. And minus times minus gives plus. So this term here, if we apply the recursion formula with this counter term, I told you that the counter term does not only subtract the divergence of the graph gamma three, but what it really does is exactly this. So here, this is the divergence of the subgraph gamma three. And here we add something else, namely uh, some sub divergence of gamma three is again subtracted. And what is uh, the meaning of this operation? 
The meaning of this operation is, of course, exactly uh, this, that the first term here, the divergence of the two-loop graph is non-polynomial, since it's the divergence of a full two-loop, uh, one-particle irreducible graph. So this is a non-polynomial divergence. And this is essentially a one-loop counterterm inserted into a two-loop graph. And we know from experience this is also non-polynomial. So this is also non-polynomial. And the sum of the two gives a polynomial divergence, as we know, and as it must. This is the point. Sum of counterterms gives a polynomial. And so applying recursively this formula, we see how these uh, non-local bits arise. So if we apply it, we get some different terms in our sum. Each term is now non-local, but the sum, of course, must remain local. But now we have an explicit formula in terms of divergences of uh, explicit Feynman graphs. And this gives us the forest formula. So let us try to write this in a systematic way. Just reading off from the example, our full renormalization of the graph contains simple terms like this, which are now in the new notation minus t subscript gamma 1 applied on the full graph. So we get this term, and we get uh, those terms from below here. And so overall, we obtain R bar of our three-loop graph would be the full graph. Then um, from those terms with uh, the one-loop subdiagrams, we get minus T sub gamma 1 on G minus T sub gamma 2 on G, so these are the two one-loop triangles contracted to a point, left and right triangle. Then we have T gamma 1 and T gamma 2 applied on the full graph. This was this diagram here with the two one-loop counterterm insertions. This is also simple. There is nothing much to calculate here. And from our uh, previous discussion, we obtained now minus T subscript gamma 3 applied on the full graph, minus T subscript gamma 4 applied on the full graph. These are the non-local divergences from the two-loop subdiagrams. And then we add plus T gamma 3 times T gamma 1 applied on the full graph, plus T gamma 4, T gamma uh, 2 applied on the full graph, corresponding to those additional terms that we found. And this is the full result. So how can we write this result in a systematic way? So what you see here is exactly forests arising. Namely, you either have single one-loop subgraphs, or you have no subgraph. No subgraph means the empty set, uh, empty forest. Here you have a forest like this one. Here you have two disjoint one PI subgraphs, which is something like that. Here you have single two loop graphs, like here. And here you have nested one loop and two loop subgraphs, like here. And that nesting arose uh, from applying recursively the formula because you go then from one big subgraph to smaller and smaller sub-subgraphs. This generates such a nesting. So overall, this means that we have here the sum of all normal forests. Normal forests are the forests without the full graph. The full graph doesn't appear here in any anywhere. So we have only normal forests, U. And then for each forest, we take the product of all the sub-diagrams in the forest, and for each sub-diagram we have minus t subscript gamma i applied 
on the full graph. And here the empty set is also allowed as a forest. If we have the empty set, then uh, there is no T, then we just get the full graph. And uh, if in the set we have just one subgraph, then we get terms like this. If we have two graphs in the set, then we get terms like those here. Then we see here something from the calculation. We automatically obtained an ordering of the T operations. So the T operations are ordered such that we first need to um, take the divergence of the inner subgraph, and then we go from the inner to the outer and outer subgraphs. And uh, that is not visible here, so we have to write down an additional uh, convention which follows from the calculation T i times Tj is always ordered according to nesting. such that the uh, writer, uh, so that we first evaluate the smaller um, divergence and then the bigger one. Therefore, let us write down the full so-called forest formula, namely, a bar of any graph defined recursively as before can be now be written alternatively as the sum over all normal forests u of the graph. For each term we have the product of all subgraphs gamma i uh, in the forest and for each we have minus t sub gamma i finally applied to the graph. And trivially, we can also extend this to the fully renormalized graph without bar, which simply includes the overall counter term, and the overall counter term, of course, subtracts the remaining local divergence from whatever is here, and that just means that we add another minus t for the full graph and we can simply say this by writing here sum over all full or normal forests. So we get exactly all of this plus all the other forests where we always add the full graph which subtracts the remaining divergence. Let us prove it exactly, but let me make a poll uh, at this point. So I was not sure whether we should uh, do a full proof, an all order proof of the forest formula, or whether the example is sufficient. I mean, what is your comment on this? Uh, do you think the example is totally convincing, or are we in need of a full proof? Uh, no. I would not say so. I would do it anyway, but I just was curious uh, what are your comments. But I think it's good to go through this proof now in full because it will again um, enlighten some concepts and structures of the subgraphs and so on. And it is just a way to practice more dealing with forests and what are properties of forests and subgraphs and so on. So the proof goes by induction. So we assume that the forest formula is true at lower orders. And we consider some particular 
one particle irreducible graph G. And we don't know whether the forest formula is true for this graph, but we know that is true for all graphs which have one order less. So the original recursive definition was R bar of G equal G plus the sum over all gamma 1 up to gamma s, which are disjoint uh, 1 pi subgraphs, which are not equal to the full graph. Let's write it down. Disjoint 1 pi different from the full graph. And then we take each time g divided by the union times, let's write here directly, minus t applied on each subgraph. So this is the counter term for subgraph 1 up to minus t applied on r bar of subgraph s. This is the original definition. And our induction hypothesis tells us that uh, the forest formula is correct for all lower order graphs. If it is correct for all lower order graphs, then it is correct for all one particle irreducible subgraphs which are not equal to the full graph, because each of them must have one order less at most. Therefore, the induction hypothesis, the forest formula at the top, is valid for each of those R bars of the subdiagrams. So that means from our induction hypothesis, we can replace that by the forest formula for each of those factors. Let's do it. Therefore, the whole thing is equal to G plus the sum over all gamma 1 to gamma s with all these properties. So it's the same sum, G divided by gamma 1 union up to gamma s. Now here we have the following. We have a product of uh, gamma 1 up to gamma s. And then we have for each of them a sum over all normal forests of gamma 1 and all normal forests of gamma 2 and so on up to gamma s. So we have a sum over all normal forests, let's say u1 up to us of gamma 1 up to gamma s. And for each of these normal forests, we get the appropriate definition. So we have here product of i from 1 to s. So for each subgraph, we have one factor. And what are those factors? We have, uh, first of all, the overall minus t. That is the minus t here from the bracket. And then the minus t acts on r bar. And for r bar, we plug in. Uh, that result here. So we have already the sum, and then we have a product, pi. The product goes over all gamma i prime, which are contained in the forest ui for the subgraph gamma i. And then for each, we have minus t subscript gamma i prime multiply all of them, and then it acts on the subgraph gamma i. So this round bracket here corresponds to this round bracket. Right? So we have the overall minus t, and then r bar is replaced by the forest formula, where g is replaced by gamma i. And then we have here the product over all the gamma i's from 1 to s. Yeah, you could have uh, the sum over all product over all the i's and then sum over all forests specific for the i. Uh, 
or I factor out the sum over all forests for all the i's. That is the same, isn't it? So, but now let us uh, write it simply using overall this notation with a subscript. So, here we have not used the notation with a subscript. So, we can pull out the minus t and use the subscript notation here for this. Then we get g plus the sum overall possible subsets of one pi disjoint subgraphs, which are not equal to the full graph. Then we have the sum over all the forests, u1 up to us. And then the product of all these uh, factors. And uh, now I pull in basically the g, and then we can write it as minus t subscript gamma i because that t acts on the sub-diagram gamma i, and then the whole thing is inserted into the full diagram. So we can write it like t subscript gamma i, and on the right we act on g, and then we have also the other factors that times the product of gamma i prime element of the forest u i times minus t subscript gamma i prime, and the whole thing acts on g. That is the same, just uh, written using the other notation. And so we have here now a double sum. We have a sum over all possible sets of disjoint subdiagrams, and then for each, a sum over all forests. And so each of these is smaller forests with fewer loops, and that is why we know that for each of them the forest formula is valid. And all that remains to do is to identify that this sum overall sets of subdiagrams times a sum overall individual forests is the same as the sum over of all overall forests for the full diagram. And that is now what we need to do. And therefore we need to look at the structure of forests. And then we can see that the two different looking sums are actually the same. So let's look at any normal forest U of the full graph G. So normal forests are those which do not contain the full graph. And then in those forests, we can define something that we might call maximal elements. Let's say M1 up to Ms. Maximal elements are elements in a forest, so sub-diagrams in a forest, uh, such that uh, they are maximal in the sense that uh, so th if there is a nesting, then from the nesting we only take the biggest part of the nested list of subgraphs. That's basically the idea. So uh, more formally, this means that any element of the forest U, so any subdiagram, is either part of uh, one of these maximal elements, uh, and uh, not either, but uh, is part of one of the MIs, and the MIs are disjoint. <laughs> 
Now that's very clear. If you have disjoint subgraphs, then uh, they might give rise to two different maximal elements, but if you have nested subgraphs, gamma 1 and gamma 3, then gamma 3 is the maximal subgraph and gamma 1 is contained in it. So it's a very natural definition. And very clearly, in each forest where you have some nested uh, um, sub diagrams, you take only the biggest one in the nesting, and if you have this joint, you take all of them. And then each element, um, so basically you can partition a forest into partitions corresponding to each of those maximal elements. Let's write this down, you can partition the forest into subsets corresponding to these maximal elements mi. And if you want, we can do an example. So let's say we take the example here of gamma 1 and gamma 3. Then uh, okay, our forest contains gamma 1 and gamma 3. Uh, there is only one maximal element, m1, which is gamma 3, and then uh, the partition is trivial, but on the other hand, if we have uh, these two triangles in our forest, gamma 1 and gamma 2, which are disjoint, then uh, we have one maximal element m1, which is equal to gamma 1, and the second maximal element m2, which is equal to gamma 2. And it becomes more interesting at the four loop or five loop level, where uh, each of these um, partitions might contain several elements. Now if you take such a partition, so you partition the forest into these different partitions, each partition corresponds to one maximal element, then what is the structure of each partition? For example, this partition here or that partition. So each set is again a set of the form. You have one big graph, gamma 3 in that case, and all the other graphs in the set are subgraphs of the big graph. And the subgraphs in the set, of course, fulfill all properties of a forest. So what we have here is a forest, but a forest corresponding to this smaller graph, gamma 3. And actually, the forest, by definition, contains the big graph gamma 3 itself. So it's from the point of view of gamma 3. This is a so-called full forest, which contains gamma 3 itself. So each partition is a full forest corresponding to the graphs mi. So if you think about that, then if you imagine the sum of all forests, all normal forests, then the sum of all forests is equivalent to first of all summing over all possibilities for these maximal elements all possibilities for the maximal elements mi to ms. And what are all the possibilities for the maximal elements? Maximal elements are pairwise disjoint and one particle irreducible, so we sum over all possibilities for having s different disjoint one particle irreducible subgraphs. And then for each of these we have a full forest, so we have to sum over all full forests of uh, the MI. And then we see our sum over all forests can be split into a double sum over all these subsets, and then the full forests 
And so uh, by comparing, we see that this is exactly what we have here at the blackboard, just in different notation, because here we needed the sum over all pairwise disjoint one pi subgraphs gamma one to gamma s, and then the sum over all forests for each of them arose from the forest formula at lower orders. And here we have exactly the same split up of uh, all sums over all forests. And so here uh, we can replace that by the sum over all normal forests, and then we have proven our forest formula. That's it. That is the proof. And let me just uh, remark, we have now proven actually only one of the two forest formulas because there was this one for the R bar and there was the other one for the R, the fully renormalized version. And that is a trivial extension. But let me just uh, comment and write it appropriately. So just extremely briefly, the proof for the full R of G So there we have the sum over all uh, normal plus full forests. Of this operation, let's say uh, then product of gamma i element of the appropriate forest times minus t sub gamma i, and then it goes on. So this is, of course, the sum over all normal forests. With this minus t gamma i plus the sum over all full forests, but each full forest is nothing but a normal forest where, in addition, we add the full graph and by adding the full graph, the product just gets extended by an extra factor minus t with a full subgraph, with a full graph times the remaining product. And therefore, the whole thing looks like one minus t acting on the full graph times r bar of g, which is uh, the definition using the recursion formula. So there is not much to prove here. Again, let me just uh, give you a note. Again, what we have proven here and in the previous case is the um, structural equivalence of first counter terms and then the recursion formula, and now between the recursion formula and the forest formula. So on a graph by graph level and for terms involving these operations, all the formulas are equivalent. But of course, we have not done convergence proofs. But using all these structural equivalences, we have now three ways to uh, structure our convergence proof. We could either do it by adding counter terms from Lagrangian and check what they do, or we can apply the recursion formula and try to prove from their finiteness, or we can use the forest formula and try to use that as a basis of a convergence proof for integrals. And depending on what we like best or what might be easiest and leads to the most elegant mathematical proofs, one of the three options might be best. And so Zimmermann has invented the forest formula and he has then given a convergence proof based on this, which is equivalent to the previous BPH theorem, which used the recursion formula. So let me just say this, there is BPHZ, theorem, which was given by Zimmermann, which is that this formula plus appropriate and precise definition of this T operation, 
can be directly applied to the integrand and then the proof of convergence can be structured like this. So before doing any integration, we apply the, uh, the forest formula onto the integrand. So we start with an integrand of a graph G, then we get an integrand of um, R of G by applying the forest formula. And then one can prove that this integral is finite. This is the structure of the convergence proof in this setup. And here the nice thing is uh, that one doesn't need any regularization. Because the forest formula gets rid of any intermediate counterterm Feynman rules and so on which are divergent but it can be directly applied on the integrand and uh, after applying all of these terms you get an integrand which is manifestly finite and which defines the theory. This is quite uh, elegant. Okay. Now we can make a break and um, discuss whether we should go on and how much time we have. Let me clean the blackboard. So let's not do the thing with the colored pictures. Let's hope we can do this in 45 minutes uh, before the battery runs out and the memory card runs full. Let us change gears a little bit and discuss momentum routing and tree diagrams inside of loops. Let's write down a Feynman graph, a two loop, one particle irreducible graph, like our famous um, self energy. And let us fix the external momentum. So the external momentum is now fixed to P. P flows in from the left and P flows out to the right. Now your task is to define the momenta of the five internal propagators. What are the five values of the internal momenta? That is not unique. And uh, there are many different choices, but what are the different choices and what is the structure of the different choices that we have. Everybody has 20 seconds to think of one choice and hopefully you all think of different choices. Let's call the loop momenta K1 and K2 and then you think of some choices. So what choices did you find? I have one choice. So here in the propagator, let's call it propagator one, two, three, four, five. Let us always use these line labels, one, two, three, four, five. And then we can ask, what is your momentum for propagator one? So anybody has something else? Uh -huh. Anybody something else as uh, K1 or minus K1? No? Oh, okay, then another 20 seconds to be more creative. Okay, 
uh, any choice? How did you start? I see that you are still writing, but let's begin. What did you choose now for K1 uh, or instead of K1? For example, you, what did you have? plus k1 minus k2. Okay, p plus k1 minus k2. And then here in this propagator, automatically it is fixed by momentum conservation. Um, k2 minus k1. k2 minus k1. And then here I guess you have a choice. What did you choose here? Uh, k2 Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that is also a possibility. So actually this is an excellent example because somehow you manage to have K2 here at the same place. So K2 has not changed in this propagator number two, but um, uh, this has changed a lot. What is actually the change? Can we describe what has changed in terms of a replacement rule from here to here? Is it true that you simply replaced K1 by K1 plus P minus K2? Is this true everywhere? I think it's not true. Because here you have replaced K1 by uh, this, and here K1 replaced by that. Then this replaces this propagator here. Uh, but by the way, I think your, your momentum is not really conserved, which we also uh, can verify by noticing that this doesn't work. <laughs> So some, something is wrong. Plus P, for example. So if here K2 flows, and then here must be K1 plus P. And then indeed the replacement rule works everywhere. So it works also here in the middle propagator, and so on. So you see, uh, some things that you see, first of all, the momentum routing is not unique, for sure not. There are infinitely many choices, but um, if you go from one to the other, you can actually always go uh, from one to the other by replacing some momenta by a shift. So you shift one uh, integration momentum uh, uh, with a linear combination of all the external and the other loop momenta. That doesn't change the integration measure. And uh, in this way, you go from one momentum routing to another one. You could also change the sign of the loop momenta if you want. Um, but these are the uh, options that you can do. So let us make this a little bit more systematic. So if you remember how the loop integrations arise from the beginning in quantum field theory, then initially in the derivation of Feynman diagrams and the integrations, we are in position space. We are in X space, and each vertex has a position X1, X2, X3, and so on. And uh, then we do a Fourier uh, transformation. And in this Fourier transformation, we first of all have, for each line in the diagram, we have one integration over the line's momentum. So let's say D, D, K, L. And, uh, then for each vertex, we have a delta function corresponding to momentum conservation. Let's say vertex V, we have a delta function for the sum of all momenta into the vertex V. That is the beginning expression. And then we simply erase, or let's say integrate as many line integrals as possible to get rid of the delta functions, and then some integrals remain. And those integrals are the loop integrals. And actually, one delta function also remains for overall momentum conservation. 
That's why we get a number of loops is equal to the number of lines minus number of vertices plus one. And that shows you that no matter how you do it in detail, so you can eliminate several different uh, choices of delta functions in terms of different orders of the integrals, but what always remains at the end are for each remaining loop, there is one propagator which carries precisely the loop momentum without any extra linear combination here. So this is always uh, the direct result from this combination here, uh, from this calculation. So we have here K1, K2. Here K2, but we never have K1 because we already did something non-trivial afterwards. But we can always use a momentum assignment where one propagator carries K1, somebody else K2, and then the rest is determined by momentum conservation from evaluating the delta functions. So this always gives after a sequence of steps, which can be done in different orders, one delta function for overall uh, momentum conservation. times integrals for each loop, loop i, and then remaining integrals d, d, k, i. And so let's write this down, this simple observation. So what happens after the sequence of steps always is each propagator momentum is a linear combination of external momenta and loop momenta. Let's say PIs, PIs are the external momenta and KIs, which are the loop momenta. What are the coefficients in each delta function? Uh, first of all, there is a sum of all the lines momenta going into the vertex with coefficient one. So after evaluating a certain number of delta functions, what always remains are integer coefficients in each of those linear combinations. So no surprise, we always have here integer coefficients, k1 minus k2, k1 plus p, and so on. Then, as I said, for each loop, for we have capital L loops, for L selected propagator momenta are equal to the loop momenta. K1 to KL. This is clearly always possible, but not necessary, but possible. But since it's possible, let me call such a momentum configuration let me call it standard uh, momentum routing. This is not unique, of course. So there are many such standard momentum routings. But there's no loss of generality to assume that we take such a standard momentum routing. So, and as we already saw, this is, uh, I think this doesn't need a proof. It's quite easy to see from the examples and you can combinatorically prove it if you want. But each of these uh, standard momentum routings is obtained from any other one. By uh, Ki going to Ki plus some linear combination Aij times Kj plus 
Ij, Pj again with integer coefficients. But we can allow more general momentum routings. For example, there is nothing wrong with uh, assigning here non-integer coefficients. So for example, let me just um, make this a little bit more complicated. So instead of routing the external momentum P, like that here through the diagram, so P flows here, P flows here on, then P flows here and here. We can route it like here P over two, and here we also add plus P over two. Then we have also here P over two, um, or maybe here we only need P over two, then P half flows here, P half flows here, and another P half flows here, and then the full P flows here. So we can route it like this. And that would correspond to, again, a replacement like K1 going to K1 plus one half P. Nothing wrong with that. But again, we can go from also such a routing to any other one by just shifting the loop momenta accordingly. Just as a side note, um, loop momentum rescalings are forbidden at the moment. So in all our evaluation, from this initial expression in quantum field theory in position space up to the final expression in terms of loop integrals, we never do a variable substitution which changes the integration measures by definition. I mean, we could without changing the integral, but then our loop integral would definitely take a different shape, different form. Uh, but, so we don't do that right now. Now, let us look at spanning trees and momenta. Take any standard momentum routing So let's do some examples. So the left was a standard routing. So we have here K1, K2. Then P minus K1, P minus K2, K1 minus K2. Or another standard routing Okay, the right one is already a non-standard routing, in particular after my modification. So let's use some other standard routing. Um, for example, let's put K1 here, and for example, we can put K2 here into the middle, similar to uh, what you have done, but without the P. So let's try to do it. So P flows in, then uh, K1 flows here, K2 flows here, then here we have P minus K1. Here K1, K2, here we have K1 minus K2, and here we have then P minus K1 plus K2. Okay, so this is also a standard momentum routing where there are two propagators which directly carry the loop momentum without anything else, and the rest is uniquely determined by momentum conservation at each vertex. So we take such a standard momentum routing and remove the lines which carry these loop momenta. 
Okay, so what happens if we remove the lines which directly contain the loop momentum? So here we remove this line K1 and we remove that line K2 or we remove this line here K1 and that line K2. What do we obtain by removing those lines? So what we obtain is this graph here, uh, sorry, it's this graph and here we obtain this graph. These graphs that we obtain in this way are spanning trees, maximal tree level diagrams which are first of all tree level and second maximal in the sense that adding any additional line back would give us a loop diagram. And that is systematically always the case. So the remaining diagram is a spanning tree. So we can prove it, but the proof is basically obvious. So the remaining diagram is a tree level diagram because we have removed precisely those lines which carry the loop momentum which remained after evaluating all the delta functions. So these are the loop momenta which are not fixed by the delta function. So if we remove them, then uh, all the loop momenta are fixed by construction from how it arose. And that means a diagram where all momenta are fixed by momentum conservation is a tree level diagram. So, because all momenta unambiguously fixed. In terms of the external momenta and uh, also these loop momenta. It is also maximal because clearly if we add back any of these lines, then of course we have the loop momentum which is arbitrary. So it's spanning since maximal, since adding back any line gives a loop. So that is quite clear. So each momentum routing defines a spanning tree, but the converse is also true. Oh, similarly, obviously. So conversely, take a spanning tree then this spanning tree defines a standard momentum routing because take any of the missing lines and associate one loop momentum to it and then the rest of the loop moment or the propagator momenta are unambiguously determined by momentum conservation so let's say take Let's write down any spanning tree which we haven't over there. For example, let us write down this spanning tree. We know that this is a spanning tree of the diagram. It doesn't exist over there. And uh, the claim is, and it's obvious, that this can be used as a basis for a standard momentum routing, which means now that this propagator needs to get momentum K1. That propagator needs to get momentum K2 and the rest should be now, uh, we should be able to define the rest accordingly and of course we are. So let's give the sign. So here, then here we have P minus K1. Here we have P minus K1 minus K2. Here we have uh, P and here we have then P minus uh, K2. So it's possible to define it and this is no surprise. <coughs> 
So we can fix the remaining momenta to be the loop momenta and therefore there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between those standard momentum routings and spanning trees. This is nice to know. This is nice to know. So now we have an idea of what is the set of possibilities, how we can define the loop momenta in a Feynman diagram. Why is this interesting? Because eventually we want to do integrals over the loop momenta. And then, for example, it could be interesting to know are the loop integrals actually independent of how we assign those loop momentum routings. And uh, the question arises immediately if we think, think of uh, Schwinger parameters and the semantic polynomials. So let us immediately look at the consequence of what I said now to the semantic polynomial, which is in the denominator. As I said in the exercise, I, unfortunately I called it uh, vice versa, so I called it V, but it should be called U. Let me now call it U, so this is the semantic polynomial responsible for the ultraviolet divergences. So let's have here some momentum routing. Some momentum routing. Then what we need to look at in Schwinger parameters is this expression. We sum over the linear combination of all the propagator momenta times the alpha parameters. So this linear combination gives us a certain expression as a function of alpha. Then what we needed to do we was to write it as a quadratic form in the loop momenta, complete the square and so on. So what was particularly interesting was this part of the expression, which can be written in matrix form like all the loop momenta as a, a row vector times a matrix times a vector of all the loop momenta. So this is an L by L matrix when we have L loops. And this is the quadratic part of this expression and then we have something linear in all the loop momenta plus something constant in all the loop momenta. And then the semantic polynomial U is nothing but the determinant of that matrix M which defines the quadratic form. So what we can now ask is, is this semantic polynomial U or the determinant of M actually independent of the momentum routing or does it depend on the momentum routing? As we said, this is responsible for the UV divergences. So it would be nice to know whether this depends on some arbitrary choice that we have or not. So let's check it. We can check it for an example or for the general case, so the battery runs low, so I don't know, but let's uh, quickly look at an example. So let's look at the two-loop graph. The two-loop graph has a two-by-two two matrix M. Two-by-two two matrix M, A, B, B, C, okay? So this is the two-by-two two matrix, whatever it is, all these entries are alpha parameters, and yesterday we discussed it in the exercise, and let's just do one uh, example. So from one routing to the next, we go over by replacing K1 by K1 plus a linear combination, and let's just do K1 goes to K1 plus A times K2. Let's look at what happens now. By the way, if we shift it by the external momentum P, then the quadratic term here does not change at all. So if we change the momentum, loop momentum by external momentum, clearly 
the semantic polynomial is independent of that. But what happens if we change it by another loop momentum? This can happen. And uh, so how does the matrix actually change? So in this way, we get, uh, instead of M, we get a new matrix. And the new matrix arises from all these quadratic terms. So remember, here in this corner, we have the term K1 square. What is the coefficient of K1 square? Previously, it was A. After this replacement, it is still A. Here, we have the coefficient of K1 times K2. Previously, it was B. But after this replacement, we get something additional from the A. A times K1 square goes to A times K1 times K2 times 2A. So we get here an additional B plus A times capital A. B plus A times capital A. And here, what is the coefficient of K2 square? So the K2 square changes. First of all, we get the original C from before, and then we have additional terms. So K1 square goes to um, A square times K2 square. So we get an additional term plus small a square times capital A. And K1, K2 goes to K2 square times small a. So we get here plus 2a times b. OK, so our matrix has changed. So the matrix M is not independent of the momentum routing. What about the determinant? What is the determinant of this compared to the determinant of that? It is the same. And you can see, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but I think in mathematics you have these rules. For example, if you have a matrix and you add minus A times the upper line to the lower line, then the determinant doesn't change by this operation. So such a linear um, change of one row by a multiple of another row doesn't change the determinant. So if we multiply this row by minus A and add it to the second row, then this cancels and uh, that also cancels. Then if we add here minus the left column to the right column after we have already canceled this, then that also cancels and uh, we see that the matrices become equal. So that shows that the determinant doesn't change. Determinant M stays the same. So that we see here in the example. Is this true in general? So in general, we can do it like this. We have one vector of all the loop momenta and a variable substitution which uh, is allowed to go from one standard momentum routing to another one would be like this. So we take one of the loop momenta at a time and replace it by itself plus a linear combination of all the other ones. And let's choose here K1 as an example. So we go to this plus uh, all zeros for everything else. But K1 gets an additional term sum over AJ, J bigger than 2 times KJ. So this is a replacement which we can do. And uh, that means we multiply our vector of loop momenta with this matrix. And now you see very easily that uh, this is a multiplication of our vector of loop momenta. And the change that we get in the M is basically, so let's call this matrix B. So after this replacement, M goes to B transpose times M times B. But the determinant of this matrix is, of course, 1. Therefore, the determinant doesn't change. So 
That means the conclusion is the semantic polynomial U, which is the determinant of M, is independent of the momentum routing. And you can view this as an, exam uh, as an example of an advantage of Schwinger parametrization because now we make ourselves independent of this uh, arbitrary choice of momentum routings. While if we do the direct integration in terms of loop momenta, of course, uh, the integral depends directly on this. Now it doesn't anymore. And this is certainly conceptual progress. But what remains to be understood is if it's independent of the momentum routing, what actually is it? What is the semantic polynomial u? We know how to calculate it from the determinant, but uh, that seems to be a way which is depending on the momentum routing because first we have to fix the routing, then we define the quadratic form, we read off the matrix M, then we obtain a result which actually is independent of uh, whatever we started with. So maybe there is a more direct way of obtaining the semantic polynomial which makes manifest that it is independent of the momentum routing. Let me do this uh, as the final um, item for today. Let us pick one spanning tree. Let's call it capital T. For example, let us do this one. Then, as we said, this spanning tree defines one particular standard momentum routing where these two propagators here, which are outside the tree, have the loop momenta k1, k2. Now, let us think of the semantic polynomial, which is a linear combination of all five propagators. Let us set um, only, let's say, what was it? One uh, line, one, two, three, four, five. Let us set all the alphas to zero um, except for the ones outside of the tree. Alpha i equals zero where i is in the tree and alpha i l non-zero where i l is not in the tree. How many alphas are there which are not in the tree? There are as many alphas outside the tree as there are loops because for each loop there is one alpha outside of the tree. So this, that, therefore I denoted the index I L like this. So L runs from one to two because we have two loops. As many as there are loops. So we have now fixed a certain set of alphas to be zero and nobody can stop us from evaluating the semantic polynomial just for this special case where many, many alphas are zero and only two out of the five are actually non-zero. What is the semantic polynomial in this particular case where three alphas are zero and two other alphas are non-zero? Can we know this? Now, since we have picked a spanning tree and we know uh, that u is independent of the momentum routing, we can now define a special routing which is ideal to evaluate the semantic polynomial. What could be the best possible routing for evaluating the semantic polynomial? Well, the best possible routing is certainly the one where these two alphas are uh, defined as k1 and k2. 
that is a possible routing and is certainly the best routing that we should take if these two alphas are non-zero and all the other alphas are zero. So nobody can stop us from doing that. So let's choose this standard routing. Let's say routing where, so um, the line K1 and KL are on the lines I1 up to IL. So these lines where the alpha are non-zero or the lines which are not in the tree, these are the lines which carry directly the loop momenta without any additional linear combinations. That gives one possible way to evaluate the semantic polynomial. Now what is the value of the semantic polynomial for that case? So the sum di times alpha i now reduces to the sum over all loops l equal 1 to the number of loops and we only have the lines for the non-vanishing alphas i l. Right? So for each loop momentum, we have one non-vanishing alpha, and we only sum over those appropriate propagators. So in the example, it's about these two alphas times the appropriate propagators. And then we have chosen the loop momenta in those propagators to be identical to the loop momenta. So this is nothing else but L from one to capital L. And here we have k l square times alpha i l plus linear terms in k and uh, constant terms in k. So that's it. So in this momentum routing, the matrix M is just the unit matrix or with alphas on the diagonal. Therefore, the matrix M is just the matrix alpha i1 alpha i l on the diagonal and everywhere else we have zero. And then the determinant and the semantic polynomial u is nothing but the product of all these alphas, alpha i l, l from one to the loop number. So and in our case, the semantic polynomial would be the product alpha one times alpha five, nothing else. Okay, and that can be written in a different way because we started by picking a spanning tree T and uh, those alphas are the ones outside of the tree so we can write it as product of all the lines I which are not part of the tree 